sort of the end times now. Yeah, I think so. I think we're in, likely in the what is known prophetically as the fig tree generation. And uh, so there's two issues when you say a fig tree generation is then a generation is, is A, how long is that generation? And, you know, what would sort of start that last generation? And sort of with the caveat that one of the issues with uh, Christians and prophecy is, is there's way too many people out who have said the end is coming and predicted dates and the credibility issue uh, is 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 an issue because Correct. we've done that to ourselves. And, so. and we saw it most recently with this solar event as well. Yeah. You know, some people thought, oh, this is the sign of the end times. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, which is why, you know, even with people that maybe um, like a lot of things about it, right about, there's going to be issues because I, I tend to stick to a pretty firm set of disciplines in how I approach things. So, right. If, if we were in the fig tree generation, that's the generation Jesus is talking about when he provides the chronology of major end time events when the disciples asked him. And he said all of these events are going to happen uh, in this generation and heaven and earth will pass away, but mm. his words would never pass away. So there's a specific fig tree generation and that just before he provided um, those sets of events, uh, he had gone in and predicted the fall of the of Jerusalem and the temple. Um, and just before that, he had killed a fig tree that um, he said was no longer bearing fruit. So the fig tree in the Old Testament is is understood in prophetic application and allegory uh, that's defined within the Old Testament um, to be the southern kingdom, which is the people that we know as Judah today, versus the northern kingdom, which are the lost tribes of Israel. Um, and so when the southern kingdom, by that sort of implication, would be back in as the fig tree blooms again in the covenant land, then that would be the generation. And so if we're in that fig tree generation, we have many, not all, but a lot of the uh, southern kingdom, the people we know as the Jewish people, in the land of the land of the covenant, and they declared their independence in 1947, fought their war for independence in 1948. Uh, and so some people would look at 1947 as a start date. Mm. And, and I come along and I say, well, that's interesting, but one of the epicenters is Jerusalem. <laughs> for end time prophecy. So if you're going to do a start and we're going to use that as the basis that I think might be reasonable um, because there's not two, two predictions that would follow Oof. this line of prophetic thought that, yeah. okay, we're in that generation. That's what, that's what's frightening me right now, by the way, there is yeah. something in the air right now that leads yeah, me to believe that we're getting closer to this sort of end times event, yeah. uh, especially with the world, in my opinion, they will turn on Israel. That's kind of what we're seeing right now. The world is turning on Israel. And even they're saying that if if everyone turns on us, we're willing to stand alone. Yes. So that is playing into uh, end times prophecy. Yes. And so the end in the Middle East is going to be the epicenter of the end time. And Jerusalem has to be in place and it has to be in control of, of, of the southern kingdom. And 1967 is when they got control of Jerusalem. And now it's been, you know, with uh, even though it was policy, it was Trump who had it recognized yeah. as its capital. And, of course, everybody said that would start World War III. It really didn't. But uh, we're going to see lots more of this, though, as we go through, because we're not quite there yet in terms of the last seven years. And there's lots of things yet to be fulfilled. So we want to be careful from a Christian perspective not to get ahead of biblical chronology, because we want to lose all of our credibility. We want to be able to... Um, prepare people, but we don't want to over predict because um, the graveyard has many tombstones with people who did that from a prophetic uh, getting it wrong standpoint. Right. And so a generation is not one specific number uh, that we can sort of rely on as to say that's how long that generation is. And I'll sort of 
just give four four examples of that. So mm-hmm. immediately following the fig tree generation is the days of Noah, which is as you take that back to Greek and as it, that term would be used in the original Hebrew, that could also mean a generation. Well, Noah lived 600 years before the flood and 350 years after the flood. So is it Noah's generation? Well, that's not exactly what Jesus said, but it will be like the days of Noah, both before and immediately after the flood. So it's impactful, but probably not 950 years as a generation. But we have to be mindful of that. Well, that's one of the options, but I don't think it's one of the more likely ones. And then you have 40 years in the wilderness that Israel spent, which was classified as a generation in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And so 40 years um, seems a little bit light if we've started that fig tree generation because it was 1947. That would mean 1997. We should be in the last seven years, so to speak. Correct. And 40 years from 2017 or from 1967 would suggest that we should be seeing more events than what we are right now. Oof. So so probably not there you we probably can't use that if we're in the fig tree generation the book of psalm says 70 yeah. so that would sort of place uh the 2030s as a significant decade that would maybe kick off the last seven yeah, years th- that would make sense or genesis 6 3 which is really controversial from the christians and in, in i try and explain to them it's going to be like the days of noah so maybe we that generation that is talked about in genesis 6 3 where the life the physical life of the immortal spirit of the giants received from the gods or the fallen angels in their immortal flesh was limited after their creation to 120 years so if we're in the fig tree generation we're probably in the 70 years or the 120 years and if it's 120 years there's lots more time time for things to to continue to unfold so, first yeah yeah so but it doesn't have to go a full generation it's it's going to happen within that generation so it, it could be less than that but you can make a good case that it would be the 2030s to the 2040s yeah. for the last seven years and if people wonder where i get that firm number on is it comes out of daniel 9 27 and in daniel 9 26 where it's talking about connected to a prophecy where all vision um, and prophecy is going to be fulfilled. There's one week of years that are reserved for the time of the end. And as it says in Daniel 26, twice, and as the Hebrew word ketz, which means the end time. And then that one week is seven days or is in seven years, because it's part of a 70 week prophecy of of years. Um, And it's perfectly consistent in, in terms of the application there. So you have seven years that are kicked off by a covenant, a worldwide covenant, which you would probably associate from our lens today that might be a global government and a universal religion neither of mm. which we have or we're super close of, of getting to at this point and that israel's protection would be guaranteed by that covenant so one expects to see a whole bunch of wars leading up to the point where Israel tires of war, the world tires of the wars and the things going on around the world. And part of that covenant is that the nation of Israel, as we understand it today, the southern kingdom, will be able to have peace and, the, and it will be guaranteed by the treaty. So all the sign, signers onto the treaty, which at that time will be 10 kings that rule over 10 empires in this world and of course we don't see 10 empires yet right they may be forming so where we are if we are in the fig tree generation would be in in the time of the sorrows and those are birth pangs as we would understand that allegory and described as Mm -hmm. both in the old testament and defined accordingly and those sorrows that jesus described were wars and rumors of wars pestilence uh, famine and earthquakes and if you add in what was said in luke maybe the surging of the seas as well and that they would get stronger throughout the generation and start working together so you might look at um, the pestilence we had a few years ago as being a lighter form of what's coming and that you could see pestilence and famine coming out of major catastrophes and significant wars just like we had you know the the flu after world war one right so look for them to start working together and 
again, what, I, what I'm starting to get a little bit more attention on and understanding that people are starting to say, hey, that does make a little bit more sense. This isn't being poured on to us by God. These are things that are brought on by the ones who rule this world. And so they're contrived. I expect most of them to be contrived. So when we look at, let's say, the last pestilence, for example, um, I think even though all things were done to try and put out another story that it somehow mutated naturally, the evidence is becoming overwhelming. It's an abundance of evidence proving that, disproving yeah, that, basically, yes. That it was created, right? It was mutated. Whether pretty it was intended much. to set out or not is irrelevant. It, it's but, not organic, in other words. This was a pretty synthetic. Yeah. It's, I mean, the whole genetic design of it would say that, and that's what they right. do right from the beginning. But, again, they wanted the cover-ups, so... And so I and also and that, that's that, that's the weird thing, by the way, Gary. I hate to yep. cut you off. That there's all these strange little instances where you have to sort of question things, like our support with the Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, you it, yeah. it you're okay and all right to uh, question these sort of things, and it is kind of ludicrous that we are helping the Ukraine. We're funding a lot of uh, things that we shouldn't be, yeah. and I feel that's that's not a that's not really the what we should be focused on. In terms yeah. of uh, what's going on in the world, um, getting out of these situations should be the main focus and not exactly. so much in the foreign uh, world. We, we have a lot of problems here at home, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, the, it's like it's like there's uh, and, and it's now being sort of called sort of the uniparty uh, sort of approach where it's the establishment where they have nuances on either side. But they have this war, foreign policy that is basically perpetual war and globalist driven. Yeah. And it doesn't matter whether it's the establishment Republicans or the Democrats. It's they're following the same directional sort of ideology. And the wars that have been going on since uh, World War II have basically been the policy of perpetual war. Right. Let's get us in, but let's never get us out. Get us out, exactly. <laughs> it's yeah. not designed. We're not designed to uh, just uh, win, basically. Yeah. Yeah, so got to keep the machine I, going, the cog on the wheel to keep going. It's absolutely crazy, and you know, there's a there is a time where, unfortunately, in our world, there has to be a war, but you win the war. You don't. You win the say, war. Yeah, but but and, we didn't really. Well, we sort of, you know, with with Germany, we brought in all these Nazis, and they helped us with the with NASA, yep. basically. Yep. Yep. And, you know, we, Operation we, Paperclip. Correct. We have a strange love relationship with the Nazis. I mean, we're even helping them out in the Ukraine right now. Well, yeah, yeah and that's... That's a little defend, disturbing. Yeah, not to defend Putin. Um, cause I mean, not, I don't want to defend Putin either, but I yeah. mean, it is true. There are Nazis in the Ukraine. The, the people, the Asthoff, uh, Begrade, well, uh, whatever they're and called. That, and that's his point. And it's not like... The Ukraine government is allowing a free press or freedom of religion Correct. or anything like that. Yeah. So, um, and so we, yeah, I think we have to understand that. I don't support Russia, at, by the way, just uh, in no, case you wondered. I, yeah, no, I didn't take it from that. I mean, we need to understand that yeah. uh, there's something more going on. And unfortunately, of, yes. And and as you were alluding to, this sort of. Um, this foreign entity that has a grasp on all these politicians, um, you know, they're all just trying to get reelected and they're going to kiss the brass ring and follow uh, the people that are going to pay them and support them. And that's why yeah. you have things like APAC and well, yeah. you, you, you understand. Yeah. And, you know, people look at Nazism as being right wing and it's not, it's national. It was the national socialist worker party as it was uh, first brought in and there were national socialists and so it was the eastern branch of what we understand today as progressivism and it was they, i don't they fall just, into the left or right paradigm either gary yeah. by the way and i know you don't either i know you're a lot yeah. smarter than that <laughs> so we need to understand that progressivism only came up after uh, a long time after world war ii for obvious reasons and yeah. connections and that we need to be very, very wary of how they, how things are done to redefine organizations to suit their purposes. Um, so if you look at National Socialism, it is 
you know, is it right of socialism? Sure. Is it uh, right of communism? Sure. But it certainly isn't centrist. What it does have is an oligarchical um, uh, hegemony that works in tandem with the government that is a hegemony and it's all controlled and they're all working for the same cause. If we look at what we see going on in sort of the globalist model, it's the corporate or oligarch um, structure that is wanting to be set up with socialism. Like it's trying to take uh, on, on, on the globalist promise of utopia uh, to be a globalist socialist state is what they're trying to really set up. But even in, in those socialist states, whether it's Russia uh, with communism or China with communism, there's always that 1% that still control everything that have all of the wealth. So That's true. It makes you wonder. <laughs> it makes you also, you know, with everything going on, uh, you have to think is history repeating itself. And it certainly yeah. seems it kind of is, basically. And you have to scratch your head and think, are we in the year, what year are we actually in? It's not the year 2024. <laughs> uh, it just feels like an endless cycle of the same thing yeah. we've been having since the very beginning, my friend. The the it, problems of yesteryear are still here today, in other words. Yeah, and you get that belief system within monotheism and also within polytheism. So there's probably something to it. One side has it going on forever. It's perpetual. The other side has it comes to a close, which is the monotheist side. But there's a passage in the book of Ecclesiastics that says, nothing is new under the sun. Mm -hmm. What was yeah. will be again. And then as it moves on, this is the part that people sort of ignore, is, is that... Um, the understanding and the knowledge of this, to paraphrase it, will only bring you grief and sorrow. And so there's a, there is a cycle that goes on. And we had a cycle that was ended with the flood because in my research it shows that the earth was going to be destroyed by wars and violence before the flood. And so there was a restart. And since then we've had 